I'd come back to the fourth part of the Alan Smith framework I laid out about the need to have a shared ethical, moral, um, legal vision. And above all else, a theme that I go on about in my book, which is the need to move from tunnel vision to lateral vision. Most of the tools that we developed in the late 20th century um, to make sense of the world, like economic models, apologies, Yanis, because I know you're an economist, but these lovely economic models, these lovely corporate balance sheets, these lovely big data sets are all very bounded and marked by tunnel vision. You don't have to apologize because I agree with you. <laughs> well, I was trying to needle you. But, um, but they basically treat everything that isn't inside the economic model or the balance sheet as an externality or a footprint, something outside that model. And what I would argue is that one of the things that went very badly wrong with a lot of the corporate vision and the um, economic models was treating the environment as an externality. They ignored who was going to pay for the damage that was created or the cost of the natural resources they were That's using. That's quite a big flaw in the capitalist argument then. Well, if you can actually start measuring that and putting that into your models, you start to get a very different vision of how companies are valued, how they're looking at the world. There are ways of doing that and people are developing that. Impact weighted accounting. Impact-weighted accounting. ESG I'm accounting. I'm wondering if this is going to thrill Yanis, impact-weighted accounting. Well, for that, you need the, the, the regulation that you are never going to be able to have as long as power is so heavily concentrated. Um, look, look, let me give you an example, because um, I think we didn't manage to meet Anne this summer because uh, half of Greece because burned down. Because you, know, you just turned me down. No, because half of Greece burned down, and I was going That's from... Right. By the That's way, you know... You, that exactly you is what happened, actually, in fairness, just to not to be... Trying. And, we and, and to you, missed, you missed, you missed yeah. an important part yeah. of my CV in these days. You know, I lead a political party in Greece. You presented me as if I'm an author and professor. I did. That, that's a previous you, life. You, you, you so he actually has power. Find your, your registered no, voters. No, no power. I just and, and you can, you're very free. You, as work, you aspire to have power. No, but the reason why I mentioned the, 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 the fires is because, look, speaking of green growth, okay, um, I also believe that in, in green growth, but I also believe in green degrowth. There are things that need to grow and things that need to degrow, like we need less cement, less CO2, less of all the toxic derivatives, the, the toxic fumes, right? We need fewer of those, fewer cars, whether they're electric or not, more public transport. But going back to the forest fires in Greece this summer, Greece is a failed state, right? But nevertheless, when it comes to profit making, it's very fast. So. The day after, we were devastated and the, f the flames died down. Large corporations came uh, and took over the attempt to prevent those uh, forests from uh, becoming mud baths with the first rains. So you think, oh, that's a good thing. They came to, to help uh, shore up the, you know, the soil and, and all that. First thing they did was to offer contracts to the local population that effectively signed all their rights away for 20 euros a day. Okay, forget that. That's, you could expect that. The second thing they did was they are trying to win um, new contracts for replanting the forests using genetically modified trees that will grow very quickly and they will be, give them the opportunity to, in, in the context of the green transition, uh, harvest biomass for the purposes of you know, green energy. If we allow them to do this, you're going to have, under the cover of green growth, you're going to have the devastation of the flora and the fauna of the land, and the conversion of these areas in Evia and so on into fiefdoms of Monsanto Bayer, who will have genetically poisoned the land while making it very green. Now, is this the green growth that we want? This is the green growth that this market-based system, not because it's a market, but because it's, Monsanto is not a market. Okay, they are a back. toxic monolith. There yeah. are ex numerous examples of greenwashing. There's numerous examples of companies and financiers using the green label to do all kinds of egregious things. That I would completely agree with. However, one of the other reasons I believe in competition is that I believe in checks and balances. And I don't think we can sit there and trust government alone to turn us green. When 
back in the 1970s, when Milton Friedman developed his vision of shareholder capitalism, which I did not agree with, there were two things that were very different. One, back then, people thought that they could outsource the really difficult decisions in life, the social stuff, to governments, and companies just worried about their balance sheets. And secondly, you did not have radical transparency, and most people did not know what was actually happening inside companies. Today, we have a world where no one actually trusts the government to get stuff done, and we have a world where all of you have cell phones with extraordinary levels of access to information if you choose, and many aspects of corporate life are subject to radical transparency. The reason that you know so quickly about what was happening in those forests is precisely because of this radical transparency. So I come back to the point. It's not an either or. We don't need government or companies to be green, or NGOs. We actually benefit by having different groups in society doing this. It is a good thing that actually we're not just relying on the Greek government alone to deal with replanting those forests. It's good that we have citizens armed with cell phones giving you the data you just quoted. And it's good that we've had companies coming in and feeling the need to do something about it, even if they are being essentially driven by less than virtuous principles, and even if some of the things they're doing are wrong. Many of the things that companies are doing today are better than they were doing two or three decades ago. So my question to you, Yanis, is this. Would you wind back the clock and have companies to go back to where they were 20 or 30 years ago? Would you only rely on government, the governments we have, to turn us green? Because look back what's happened in the last decade. It ain't been so good. One of the reasons why companies, why governments are under pressure to come to COP26 and do something is partly because there is a shift in zeitgeist amongst investors and businesses that reflects social shifts that comes back to radical yeah, yeah, transparency. Yeah,